storyline of our church is a storyline of intersections where we together in one big road trip were headed on a journey and it has been a story of intersections the intersection of impossibility and faith and that's where we are today and I want I want to invite you into this journey because what you experience as a family of God affects what you believe when you're by yourself let me say it this way I want you to be a part of a move of God because your personal life needs it you, you need to be in an environment where God performs miracles that you can see so that when you face impossibility at your own intersection you can go no 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 if he said it that settles it I know what the doctors say I know what the real estate firm said but if God says it that settles it can I get an amen in the house of God this morning you're a part of a move of God that chooses to believe faith that chooses to believe what God says and so I'll never forget in 2018 we needed a place to have church because all you crazy people invite your friends there used to be a couple of you and then all you showed up right and we just said we need a place we were in a portable situation and we had been told no 17 times by realtors by organizations that had venues we've been told no 17 times and I stood on the stage July of 2018 not this stage another stage like this and I said in 30 days you hear what I said 30 days in 30 days we're gonna stand on this on this stage holding holding a, a contract that says we have a building and we have no clue right now and guess what happened on the 29th day God performed a miracle that you're currently sitting in come on if you ever wonder what the future looks like sometimes all you got to do is turn your head and say if God did it then come on somebody if God did it for me yesterday he's the same God today yesterday and tomorrow touch your neighbor and say you can trust him you can trust him Woo! Woo! and so I want to bring you to the moment because hey we are at another crossroads because the church has grown so much we're at another crossroads we just got back a feasibility study from an architectural and engineering firm out of DC and with the latest urban zoning requirements for this property in West Nashville in order for us to add any square inch of ministry space for, for families and for students and kids and more auditorium space in order for us to add a square inch of ministry space we would have to go vertical in parking meaning that somewhere on our property we would have to build a parking garage I don't know if you've looked up <laughs> what it costs to build a parking garage but the cheapest and I, we're not gonna build God's house the cheapest I'm just gonna let you know it's not gonna do that parking garage the cheapest cast system that you could build is twenty two thousand dollars per spot so the minimum so the minimum that we would invest into a parking garage before we ever added a square inch of ministry space was ten million dollars excited you excited I'm excited <laughs> No, not at all. So there's a couple things we learned from the feasibility study that you have to do to, to steward a property well. Number one, we would have to go vertical in parking, and that would only solve 45% of the current parking issues we all have. So that wasn't the solution. The second thing they told us is, I don't know how you guys got this property at this price in 2018, to which I replied, I know how. <laughs> but it was a miracle purchase because it's, it has a ton of equity. So whatever you guys are doing, keep doing it. And so here's what I came to tell you today. We're at a crossroads. And I, I want you to hear this corporately, but receive it individually. Because you're the church. You didn't come to church this morning. When you brushed your teeth, you were looking at her. You are the church. Can I get amen? And so I want you to realize you individually, because when you get to heaven someday, God's not going to talk about zeal. He's going to talk about you, because you're the church. So you and I are at a crossroads. Trying to find 18 to 22 buildable acres in Nashville. All the realtors say amen. That's how many we have. Tons of them. Okay. That's impossible. What we're praying and asking God for, I want you to hear me. 
And someday this video will play on some screen somewhere because God will do it. They say it's impossible to find 18 to 22 buildable acres, not in the west side of nowhere. We're not doing that. Prime location to build God a house that will change lives forever. So we're praying for that. And then we're also praying that with the sale of this property, obviously we want to stay in this property as long as we can, like a leaseback option, but the highest and best so that we can leverage the proceeds to go build a great house of God. Now let me just tell you, let's be very honest. We have no clue where we're going. We don't know where we're going from here. And I want you to catch that. I want you to realize we're asking God for the impossible. But I desperately want you to be on that journey. Some of your faith needs an adventure. I want you to be a part of Move of God where we say things like the land, go price it. Millions and millions of dollars just for the land. Then site work, then building, tens of millions of dollars. And I just have a question. How big is your faith, church? How big is your faith? Because I want you to go on a journey where you see individually and corporately what seemed to be ridiculous and impossible. I want you to see that when you take this ride, all things are possible through Jesus Christ who is interested in building his church Amen. Come on, can we give Jesus praise in advance for what he will do? So here's what I want you to do. I just want you to begin now praying. Because here's how I want to lead our congregation through this I don't know journey. When we don't know what to do to make our own miracle happen, can I tell you what we do? We make somebody else's happen. That's just the type of church this is. In fact, based on giving you've already done, I'm not asking you to give anything right now. That's a long time from now. But guess what we've done? On your behalf, because we need a miracle, we have sowed a miracle. (laughs) See, that's the way of the kingdom. God says don't strive and use other people to get your own thing. When you need something, trust me and sow a seed. So I'm here to report. We're going to do this every single week in October because I want you to know if you want a miracle, it's not about getting greedy. It's about getting generous to a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Can I get amen? So I'm going to tell you what you've already done because your church doesn't know where to go. We don't have a home. And so in efforts to get the attention of God, my pastor always says, build a church. The the way that you build a church, you should build it in a way that gets God's attention. Give in such a way that gets God's attention. And so last week we, we made an executive decision to help people in our area. We partnered with a creative firm to figure out how to help people in our area with their medical debt. And so we worked together. We figured out a way to do that. And every single one of these families that have medical debt will receive a letter about a church that loves them and a Jesus that loves them. So on your behalf, we have already paid. You ready for this? $750,000 of medical debt. Come on, give it up for yourself. Woo! You can do better than that. That's C, baby. That's C. Woo! I'm just going to tell you, that's the type of church we're going to be. We're not going to get greedy when we have dreams. If you want to make your dream happen, make somebody else's happen. That's the way of the kingdom. That's the way of Christ. Amen? Can I pray for us? Father, would you lift your hands all over this room? Every room around the country watching online. Father, we are your church. This is your church. Whatever you can do through a church, would you do it through us? Father, we we know that we have to cross the Jordan River. Just like in Exodus, Father, you have land for us. You have a home. You have a place to build a house, Father. And what we see at this intersection is a choice. A choice to believe or a choice to run. And that ain't us. Father, we believe that we're standing at at the crossroads, Father, of the intersection of impossibility. Father, but this is a group of people that are radical enough to believe if you said it, we believe. If you said it, we believe. And so, Father, over the next several months as we pray, as we navigate this this journey as a family, I pray that you would be with us. God, I pray that you would show out. 
I pray that the miracles you delivered at this house would be in the front page of the newspaper and everybody watching this miracle would be able to testify that you indeed are a good, 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 good father in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you high five three people and say, I believe. Come, come on, tell them. We're at an intersection, but I believe. I believe. Come on, inter- high five a couple more people and say, you write the check. No, you write the check. <laughs> Tell somebody else to write that check. Y'all doing all right this morning? Well, welcome to a new series. What's up? We got boxes? I like a type sermon where we got boxes. How are you, bro? You good? Your hair looks great. Well, it's good to see you. Is everybody doing well? You sound awful. You don't look awful. I'm asking again. Are you doing well? That sounds more like zeal. You guys sounded awful at first. Um, uh, Today's a series called Best Practices. Everybody say best practices. Best practices. Coaches will tell you things like, you play how you practice. How many of you guys hated that? Yeah. How you practice determines how you play. Yeah. Practice. Practice. Practice is tough, isn't it? How many of you guys were ever on any type of team where you had to practice? Wave your hand in the air like you just do care. Yeah. Do you remember? I know you've had PTSD about those moments, but how many of you had a coach who could not speak clear English? Anybody else have the water boy coach? If you grew up in the South, you had a coach who could not speak English. Hey, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, yes, sir. Third and ten, I get, I get you, right? How many people remember the practice clothes you had? All them sweats, nasty. How many people remember what a middle school locker room smells like? Mmm, that's awful, amen? My son just made the basketball team. Shout out to Beckton. So, and um, so, so he knows, you know, daddy, daddy's got a little bit of game still left in the tank. So we went up to the gym, y'all, and I was trying to find the Spalding 1000s, so like the, the good basketballs and stuff. Y'all, I, I, uh, I, you know, I opened a couple doors in the gym, and I found myself in the middle school locker room. I'm just going to tell you, uh, that's the purest definition of hell <laughs> on planet Earth. I don't know what you middle school boys do in the locker room, but y'all are all nasty. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Whew, practice, pra- practice brings back smells. Practice brings back yells. I remember coaches that would scream. How many of you guys... Went to school where your coach said really bad words. Just, oh, y'all gonna lie in church. Some of y'all went to a Christian school and he still cussed y'all out. He waited till halftime. I remember that. Practice, pra- practice was tough. If you had a great coach, practice was ridiculously tough. I remember my freshman basketball coach. He was the winningest coach in Tennessee, Coach Whitby. He would say things to me like this Oh, so you will never play for me. He said, Your mama thinks you're cute. I don't. <laughs> Thank you, Coach Went Me. <laughs> right? <laughs> but he knew how to say the right thing that would just set me on fire. I remember he would say things like, guys, we're going to practice cardio until half of y'all quit. Go. And everybody would start running and people would start quitting. And I hated practice because practice is hard. How many of you guys remember the pre-warm-up stretches? And you're warmed up 30 seconds in, but they take it two hours. Anybody ever did P90X? <laughs> and you thought the stretch was the workout? And you're like, ooh, that was a great workout. And they're like, okay, starting in 30 seconds. You're like, what? <laughs> it's pra- practice. practice is ridiculously hard. There are parts of practice that seem unnecessary. You ever had a coach have you practice things you thought you would never do in a game? You, you, oh, you don't remember these? Let me just ask you a question. At what sport do you play where you're ever going to do this? Some of y'all surprised I can still touch my toe. <laughs> Practice. Sweaty, takes a ton of time, got to stretch, then they make you jump in a cold bath. How many of you guys love cold plunges? You guys are not human. <laughs> That's ridiculous stuff. But I, I, I want to tell you that this sermon's not an easy, fluffy ice cream Sunday sermon. The next four sermons are tough and they're hard. 
And they're potentially challenging because it's all about practice. Everybody say practice. 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 I believe as a church, it's time to practice. It's time to practice. Let's go to the book of James chapter 1. James chapter 1 talks about practice. You know, I have this question as you're turning in your Bibles, James chapter 1. Did anybody bring their own physical Bible? Any physical Bible? Come on, wave in the air like you just do care. Hello. Hello. I don't know what happened to the middle section back here. None of y'all brought a Bible. How many of you brought a glow Bible? Put it in there like you just do care. Glow Bible, Heller. Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay, that, that's cool. They both read. That, that works, okay? I wondered something as you're, as you're turning to James chapter 1. I wonder if our purpose performs at the level that we practice. Write that down. This is my purpose. Does my purpose, they, coaches always say, you, you play how you practice. And the way that I practice determines the way that I play. I wonder, does your purpose, let's take it out of sports for a minute. I wonder, does your purpose, I wonder, does your marriage perform at the level that you practice? I wonder, does your marriage go at the level of your date nights? I want to be married. I'm single, but I want to be married. I wonder, are you practicing like that? I, I really want to know the Lord. I would, I would love to increase my prayer life. How's your practice? Because practice isn't easy. It's stretching, it's hard, and it's pushing on a new muscle potentially. So a lot of how you view and handle practice probably determines how your life goes. So what does James says about these hard practice trials? Here's what he says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, trials, hardship, stretching, why? Because you know that the testing, everybody say test. 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 The testing of your faith, what does it do? It produces perseverance. You ever think that we've gotten so soft that now what feels like pressure and stretching used to be a gift for perseverance, but we look at it as though adversity is not of the Lord? Have any of you wondered if we've gotten so offendable (laughs) that we walk away from the team because the practice was hard, forgetting that practice has a purpose? Have you just ever wondered if if we've gotten so soft that what God uses to build us, we think he's burying us? Yeah, me too. I've sometimes wondered, have we gotten soft? And James says, hey, that hard stuff is good stuff. Are you listening? The hard stuff is good stuff. Medicine don't taste good. But when it gets to the bottom, still do some work, amen? Let perseverance, let practice finish its work. You know what? One of my favorite coaches, he coaches south of here in Tuscaloosa. Roll Tide. (laughs) Some of you don't like it, but that's because we beat you. Um, It's fine. (laughs) Jesus bled on a cross. What color? Orange? Mm, Probably not. Crimson, right? (laughs) So... Some of you call him Coach Satan, which, by the way, that's pretty good. <laughs> but that, that coach said something interesting about practice. He says, we're not going to practice until we get it right. Watch this. We're going to practice until we can't get it wrong. And I wonder, does our purpose perform at that level? I'm called to be a whatever. If your assignment now is a doctor, how are you practicing? Because if God gave you gifts, that doesn't mean that you perform at a 10. Maybe it's all in how you practice. Perseverance, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The further I study this text and think about the trials that these disciples would go through, I begin to find a place in my life, a positive place to look at the hard stuff, to look at practice, to look at trying something before you're discovered and trying it in the dark. Practice your purity as a man before you get married. Mm. Because practice has a place for us. I think so many times we're taught a a Sunday-only faith. And if you take the practice out, then you arrive to a scripture you don't know how to do. And sometimes we have to talk about practice. Amen? 
What does practice do for you? Practice prepares the way for your purpose. You have to have something, handles to Christianity. If you don't have handles and you don't know how to handle the scripture and you don't have some things that you can do, eventually you will arrive to a scripture that you believe but you don't see. And that is an intersection of frustration. To read things in the Bible, the 7,148 promises that God has for you, but never receive them, my gosh, that's frustrating. Yeah. And so I want to take you to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We're going to study about a guy named Jehoshaphat. Everybody say Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Dang, that was pretty good. I thought it would take us three times. Say it again. Jehoshaphat. You've been studying Hebrew. How fantastic of you. 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 3. We're talking about practice, how it prepares the way for, for your purpose. Scripture says the Lord was with Jehoshaphat. We could stop right there. How many of you guys are thankful that the Lord is with you? I mean, if, if there was never another part of this verse, if there was no other part of this text, if it just said the Lord was with J.D., how many of you guys know that would be enough? If God is with you, come on, church, if God is for you, if he's for your marriage, for your relationship, if he's for your finances, if he is for your mental health, if the Lord is with you, there is no giant too big, there is no storm too large, there is no adversity too big for you. If the Lord is with you, who can stand against you, amen? We've spent the last several weeks identifying that God is holy. What does holy mean? Morally, perfectly pure. And because he is holy, his word is trustworthy, meaning God can never give you bad advice. And when you stick your feet into the soil of that reality that he is holy and that his word is trustworthy, when you get to the practice, it becomes a little easier because I trust him. God is so holy that I can trust him with his words. Amen. The Lord is with Jehoshaphat. Why was the Lord with him? Isn't the Lord with everybody? Isn't the Lord with everybody? Doesn't the Lord favor everybody? No. God's love is unconditional. God's love is spread like a blanket all over humanity. For God so loved the His love is unconditional. His love is free and widespread. His favor, however... Is conditional. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because, why, why, why? Because he followed the ways of his father David before him. The Lord was with him, why? Because he followed the ways. The Lord loved him regardless of if he followed the way. But the Lord was with him. You know what the word favor means? It means God's supernatural hand is on you and yours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody want some favor? I, want the fa I don't want a life that gets J.D. size results. I want a life where my kids go, how did that happen? I go, God did it. Yeah. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. Interesting fact here, David wasn't his father. Esau was his father. But Esau had been following the bad ways, the opposite ways. And so he had to look back five generations for a model. But when he found someone, who I love this, who followed the ways of the Lord, he said, I'm identifying with that way. His great, 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 great grandfather, David. Hmm. He did not consult the bells, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. There are practices that are common to culture that are in direct opposition to God's ways. There are godly practices and worldly practices. There's this worldly practice of like you need a full-time job and three side hustles. You're on your grind. <laughs> Super over that. Because if you have 14 side hustles and you wonder why you don't have a spouse yet. I want to be married. No, you don't. You don't have time on your calendar for a for a date. And if you don't have time on the counter for a date, why would God send that precious lady to your house when you can't serve her? Ooh. Y'all still with me? I ain't supposed to be preaching just yet. Followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. Now watch this. Here's what I would love to be said about your 
last name. The Lord established his king, the kingdom under his control. As when Joseph, Jehoshaphat was leading, God blessed and established. Everybody say established. established. My prayer for you this year is that God would take any area of your life that is fragile, that is broken at the foundational level, that he would firm it up and he would deepen the roots of who you are and establish you. Some of you carry a last name that has a lot of baggage. And you're like, God, I want that to stop with me. From my, from my lineage forward, I want it to be a lineage of blessing and favor where God's hand is on our children, where God's hand is on our business, where we're a part of a move of God that shows everybody around me how good and how real God is. And you want that. The question is, how do you get there? Because can I tell you something that will crash some of your theological boxes? Belief won't get you there. This don't go well in the South because everybody believes. <laughs> Belief will not get you there. In fact, if you're taking notes, maybe write this down. God doesn't bless belief. God blesses practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. I believe it. That's great. That's a great start. It's not the finish line. God doesn't bless belief. He blesses practice. Asa believed what David believed, but Asa did not practice what he believed. You see this all throughout the New Testament. People that believe something but practice something else. How many of you guys know if there is a great canyon between what you believe and what you practice, at some point there's a collision? At some point, there's an identity crisis because what I believe and what I ended up practicing, there's just two different worlds. And you see this in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus telling a story because he's trying to establish you. He's trying to firm you up. He does have plans for you, but it's not just what you believe. That's why I'm super, super pro, pro you raising your hand to receive Christ, but realizing there are steps after that. Salvation isn't a finish line. Come on, somebody. Salvation is a starting line. And so many people grow up in the South going, I got baptized at 12. I gave my heart to Christ. Whew, I'm good, but I'm really bored. I'm really bored because they weren't taught that Christianity and sanctification is a lifelong process of saying yes to God, yes to God, yes to God. I'm going to do this all day. Yes to God, yes to God. That's what your life should look like. And God has some things that when you do them, your whole life gets in alignment. And when your practice and your beliefs get in alignment, watch out. That's how God establishes you. Perhaps a lot of our frustrations is very simple. Our behaviors and our practices aren't in a line with what we believe. It's like people that want to be better parents and say, I just, I don't have enough time to spend time with my kids. I can't figure out, I want to be a good parent. I want to be, it's a value for us. And I say, well, let me see your schedule. And when you look at their schedule, you go, I don't see your kids on your schedule anywhere. Don't you prioritize what's valuable to you? And they go, yeah, yeah. I'm saying, then put your kids on your calendar. How many of you guys know if you don't put something on your calendar, somebody else will? Can I get amen? amen? Jesus is talking about this and making sure that we're not just firming up what we believe, but belief is matriculating into day-to-day -day operations of our life. Matthew chapter 7 says this, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So I'm charging us forward today to not just believe what God says, but because he's holy, because he is trustworthy, put it into practice. Just try it. For years, I've always had this challenge. I've said, hey, go all in with everything God says to do for a year. Like, just try it. I've never had a person now and over seven and a half years since we started, that has taken that challenge and came back and not said anything other than my entire life has changed. Yeah. And I'm just telling you, you can trust his word. Not just in your relationships, not just with your mental health, not just with your business, not just with your past. He's not just good at handling your past. Can I tell you something? He's also great when it comes to your money. Yeah. 
He's great in the area of finance. If you don't believe me, go study the scripture. Did you know the word give in the Bible is in there way more than the word, you ready for this, love? Did you know that 30% of the second part of your Bible, 30% of the New Testament is on money and things? Why? Because God knew that would be a big deal. He knew that that would be the place where you tighten up. He knew that the number one reason for divorce and arguments would be money. He knew the number one thing that would get you to say yes to the business and no to your son would be money. He knew the number one thing that would cause you to move locations for one thing that has nothing to do with his will would be money. And so God loves you so much that he's willing to talk about it. He's willing to give you some practices. And he's holding these trustworthy so you can trust him. But I want to give you a couple reasons why to practice money God's way. You ready? Yeah. Why, do, why would you ever practice money God's way? Number one, God cares about your heart. And that's rare when it comes to money. Because can I tell you something? Your mortgage company doesn't give a flip. Now, there's some mortgage lenders in here, and you're getting real hot and heavy right now. But let's be honest. You don't pray for the well-being of their heart. You collect a check. Can I get Amen. Everybody that attaches to you as the product and is getting money from you, they're not thinking about your heart. They're thinking about you and how much money you can spend with them. There are few places and people on planet Earth that when it comes to your finances care more about you than what you can give them. And I want to show you a text. It's Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. I want to show you a unique way to look at this. Jesus is talking here, and he cares so much about your heart that he's willing to talk about your money. Oh, I'm going to say it again. Jesus cares so much about your heart, how you're really doing, that he's willing to talk about your money. Nice. Why? I'll show you. I'll show you. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth. In other words, when you think about investment, when you think about your resources, be careful that you're not short-minded because you're not an earthly being alone. You're an eternal being. Yeah. And your life on earth is this big. Your eternal life is this big. So be careful that you are not so short-minded. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, where economies go up, economies go down, where lawsuits happen, where entire industries fall. Don't store up for yourself. Don't go all in on earth. Jesus says, but rather store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Think about something that's going to make it beyond this life. Amen? Amen? Good definition of legacy, by the way. Where moths and vermins do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your money is, where your treasure is, watch this, there, that's the address, there your heart will be also. Why does God talk about money so much? I remember reading the Bible and I was like annoyed. I'm like, don't you have enough up there? Aren't your streets like gold or something? What are you talking about my money? Anybody else read it like that? I'm like, why in, the world, why in the world do I go to church and they're talking about money? Now I know why. Because Jesus knew Wherever your money is, your attention is. Yeah, if you don't believe me, if you have never invested into any stock ever, and all of a sudden you get a little penny stock, oh, your behind will be an expert. You'll be studying that thing and looking at it. You wake up first thing in the morning and talk about your stock. <laughs> you get a brand new pair of shoes, whoo, everybody's got to know. Oh, we see you on Instagram. We know. Right? <laughs> Fabuletics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we see you. Why would Jesus talk about your money? Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart. So I've got to talk about your money because that's the hardest part to get to you because it's your heart. And for some of you, the reason why it's so hard for you to talk about money with God is because you want to keep that over here. And God's like, no, I want to talk about that because that's where your passion is. So why would you ever do it God's way? Because God's the one that cares about your heart. Yeah. Amen? Amen? The second reason why I think you could trust God's plan and his practices when it comes to best practices and finances, God has a winning plan for your life. Some of you have heard this verse. Your grandmother gave it to you on a pillow or a journal when you graduated. But you, you've never like put it into practice and understanding that this verse works on a Monday. Jeremiah chapter 29, 11 is a verse you know. My question is, have you applied it to areas like this? That God knows the plans that he has for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. 
I unapologetically would tell you God wants you to have more than you need so you can be a blessing for others. Let me be very clear here because a lot of people grew up around church and you're like, is that a prosperity church? We don't have anybody say that because we don't teach that you give to get. That's so manipulative. You give to give. Amen? Amen? But I also think you should not back down from the idea that God clearly says that he wants your life to prosper. And if you look this up in its original Hebrew language, it includes your finances. God would love for you to be the person in your neighborhood to write the check to solve the problem the single mom has. Yeah. Amen? Amen? God would love for you not to point your finger at the government, but you write the check. Yeah. When there's a problem in the city, we write the check. We don't point our fingers at the government. God did not call a government to fix it. He called a church to. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And so I think it's crucial that we understand God has a winning plan. So he's holy, I can trust him, and his words are true. How many of you guys enjoyed Bring Your Own Bible weekend last week? Yeah. Wow, when you, when you stick your feet into the soil and say, I'm planting firm that God's word works, then you have to ask the question, okay, God, I trust you. You talk about money because you know my heart's there. Because a lot of people give their hand to the Lord and say, I want to serve you, but their heart's in their wallet. It's, by the way, for most of us, it's the last thing we give to him. Because some of you grew up with, without hardly anything, and so you're scared to death to go back to Poe. No, 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 you don't understand that. Some of you are like, we were poor and we didn't even know it. Oh, there's some other of us, we were well aware. <laughs> we couldn't afford to OR, y'all. We was Poe. Anybody know anybody that was Poe? Where the Raymond Noodle Club at? <laughs> Cheese and crackers, where are we at? Some of you are like, what are they talking about? You have no clue. <laughs> Everybody say, it's time to practice. I want you to experience the type of life where you can feel, sense, and know, and your kids can feel, sense, and know. This isn't results we came up with. And by the way, you're good. You're good. Some of you are like, man, I don't even know about the series, the whole financial practices of the Bible. We're doing really good. Could it be that what you're calling good is beneath what he would call blessed? Yeah. We're doing really good. Okay, that, that, that's, that's dope. That's great. But like, could that be beneath what he would call blessed? It's an interesting question. So today we're going to start, if I had one conversation, if I only had one with the Bible and you, and we were sitting in a room with your family, and I only had one conversation about finances, it would be this one. I think this to be the precursor to what God could do in your financial world. But it all starts here. It all starts with this practice. So let's go to it. Psalms chapter 24, verse 1, says this. It says, the earth is whose? The earth is the Lord's. And everybody say it together. Everything. Mm. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So today I have a major, major intersection, crossroads for all of us. Because if you look at this verse and you believe it, and then you take it a step further and you practice it, it will change everything about the way that you see about the way that you save, and about the way that you spend money. And I'm just saying, I'm going to throw it out there for you. If you believe this verse, and you practice this verse, it'll change everything about the way that you see finances. Let me start by saying, several months ago, I got an opportunity to spend a week at a monastery. No talking, you just kind of pray, you walk around, and I did get a chance to meet... Uh, Friar Timothy. He's a 90-year-old monk that just got back from Italy, and we had so many conversations. And one of the conversations that he had is, I just asked him, I said, what do you see in this generation that we don't see? You see us. What do you see that we don't see? He said, I think there's too much entrepreneurialism in the faith. Now, that's a mouthful, because I like the word entrepreneur. I like the idea of you generating an idea, having the work ethic to execute the idea, building the team around the idea, helping people with the proceeds. Like, I, I'm a big, we have tons of entrepreneurs, but I begin to step back and say, okay, in our faith, 
in our faith, in our faith, there's too much entrepreneurialism. And I begin to think about what this means, entrepreneurial. And when you think about finances in your financial world from the box of an entrepreneur, what does that mean? That means it's your idea, your work ethic, your brain power, your stuff, and your outcome. In fact, you've been trained to live this way. You think bottom line. You think outcome. And there's not a whole lot wrong with that. I mean, if you're, if you're a, a business guy and you try to start something and you think everybody else is going to do it for you, well, good luck. You're going to make nothing, right? But when it comes to understanding finances, this isn't biblical. <laughs> Perspective. So, so um, I've got several things here that I think are a big deal to you. Um, Number one, I think, I think you got to make money. I can't get an amen there? You want to live without it? We can pray that way if you want us to. Okay. You need some money? Oh, Lord, they put this in there. Ladies? I'm going to say it again, ladies. Okay, there you are. Okay. All right. I don't know whose this is, but you got a small foot. I'm talking about squirrel size. Y'all see this little big foot? I wish to God I would put my fat big toe in this thing. I'll break this thing off. Anyways, uh, a vehicle. I stole this from my, from my son's room. I'll give it back later, bro. Um, you need a vehicle. Uh, you have to have a college education. Did I go there? Nah. <laughs> and then... We'll just talk about normal stuff. Three bedroom, an acre in Franklin. <laughs> nope, I'm in a quarter acre in Bellevue. Okay, now watch this. Normal things. All of you have some type of money. I would say, how much money do you have? You have the, the, the current amount of money God can currently trust you with. Okay. Um, and then you have shopping because some of y'all just, you know. Then you have a house, you have a vehicle. Probably not this one, but if you do, can we go for a ride? Just, um, and my son, he would like to go for a ride as well. There's some type of college. Okay, so these are normal things that m most of us have. If you view yourself as the entrepreneur, the house was your idea, the location was your idea, the price point was your idea, the closing was your idea, the timeline was your idea. When it comes to your vehicle, whatever you can afford, Whatever your dream is, whatever car you like, when it comes to your job and picking the right job, it's do you feel like they're paying you enough? Do you like the culture? Do you like the boss? It's entrepreneurial questions. Your work ethic. I want to make more, so you work 68 hours instead of 49. College. Well, I want the type of college that when I wear the sweatshirt, people think this. Why? Because it's your idea. It's your choice. It's yours. You created the idea, right? It's your money. You pick, you choose, your house, your stuff. Can I take it a step further, though? If you approach your finances as though Psalms 24 is a direct lie, so everything in the world is not the Lord's. And you created your, I'm really smart, who gave you your brain? I worked really hard to get my degree. Who gave you the gift set to capitulate what the professor said and score a 4.0? You do that yourself? Did you? I'm really good at this, who gave that to you? I earned it, you sure about that? Because if you follow this out to its logical conclusion, A, when is enough enough? Because if your appetite is the dictator, you will never stop. And this is a, as a pastor is like a big passion point for me. Because some of you are thinking so entrepreneurial that you are outcome-based. And you know what you are? You're anxious. And by the way, you should be. You should be. 
You should get on medication today. Today. You should go get a medical card today for your anxiety. Why? Because it's all you. Because your industry probably won't be here 40 years from now. So you better worry about this. You got a lot of worrying to do. Oh, and when your vehicle messes up, you fix it. And when your house, when your house property takes a nosedive like 2008, well, you better worry. Why? It's yours. And when your kids pick the car, you better desperately worry about your stuff if it's your stuff. See, because if it's mine, I'm anxious. But what's interesting is God has a better practice. And it's not spiritual entrepreneurialism. It is rather, I'm not an entrepreneur with my finances. Watch this. I'm just a manager. If everything in the world and the people who live in it is truly, if you buy, you got to buy in there though. If it truly is the Lord's, my gift sets, I'm just good at this. Some of you in your job, you're good at it and you don't even know why. You're like, I mean, I work really hard, but like he gives me the time to do that and he got me the right connection. Some of you are, well, you're connected well beyond your portfolio. Why? God did that. Why are you smart at that? God did that. And if we can get us to look at Scripture and go, you know what, I'm going to repent today. What does repent mean? This means I'm changing my mind. Everything in my industry has always been about my idea, and that's why I'm worried to death. That's why I can't sleep. That's why I'm gone all the time. Why? Because when it's yours, you better strive. <laughs> but if God is your shepherd, sheep don't strive. Because it's not theirs. It ain't even their field. This monk told me at 23, he, he felt called to the monastic way of living. He's never owned anything. Not a watch, not a wallet, not an account. Doesn't have a wife, doesn't have kids. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. I ain't called to that. I ain't doing that. What he was called to, amen? But it, can I just tell you something? He ain't never worried. Because he's decided, whatever the Lord brings, I'll just manage and when it comes to the money, God, whatever you give me, I'll manage. When it comes to shopping, I'm going to run a budget because I'll spend money differently when it's not mine. I turned around because that was a good one. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Would you still buy Gucci if it was God's money? Knowing you, you're wearing more money that's in your savings account? Better put that one up. Y'all got quiet. <laughs> When it, comes to, when it comes to education or continuing education, is it his choice or yours? 86% of high school students that go to college drop out of church, meaning that this became the priority as their idea instead of following Jesus and going to whatever college Jesus said go to. So like when it's my idea, I pick it because it's a fun school. When it's God's idea, I felt led to go here. This side is driven, which is synonymous with demons. Go say scripture. What's driven? Not disciples, demons. Right. Demons were driven. Yeah. Disciples are led. Wow. On this side, when things go bad, I'm anxious. On this side, I'm available. Yeah. God, you want me to sell my house? It's not mine. The car breaks down. On this side, as a manager, you fix it. Because it's his. So the practice today is very simple. What if you practice changing the way you look at all of your finances? And you said, I am not an entrepreneur. I'm a manager. It's not my idea. I think God gave me that idea. It's a simple tweak. Simple tweak. It's not my stuff. Hey, kids, look what God has provided us. Do you see the difference? This leads to entitlement. This leads to gratitude. Do you see that? This is, I'm responsible for the outcome. So I better worry. Better be really worried. This, God has a plan for me. Plan not to harm me. And I believe he's good enough. He's going to prosper me. Prosper me. So I'll pray and fast before I say yes, because it's not my time, not my stuff. It's God's. Because the reality is, 
If you, you, if you see yourself as the owner, you're the entrepreneur, then when you get to the Bible, you're going to get ridiculously offended. Why? You think it's yours. Because there's some stuff in Scripture. I'm just going to be honest with you. Like he's going to ask you to take care of not just your generation, but two generations. There's some hard principles in here. And if you believe it's yours, you'll never do it. You'll never practice Scripture if you think it's yours. But if you can somehow, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be released from the burden and the manipulation that happens in our heart when we think it's all ours, if you can be released from that, and you go, you know what, from this day forward, I'm not worrying about what you're already working out. I'm just not going to worry about it. I have been given a gift, and I'm going to work as under the Lord. So I'm, man, I believe every believer should be the best worker, the best leader in their business world. Because we work under the Lord. We work under the Lord. We work under the Lord. And when you see yourself as a manager, you say, you know what? I trust him with the outcome. Why don't you ask yourself that real quick? If you totally trusted him with the outcome, how much less would you say yes to? If you totally trusted him, that you were just a manager. You just kind of, well, you receive it down the pipeline and you kind of manage. If you saw yourself like that, what would it change about your life? Because the practice I'm trying to move us forward in is that we don't just believe stewardship, but we commit to practice stewardship. Stewardship is every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. And for too long, many people believe that forgiveness comes from the Lord, but finances don't. Last time I checked scripture, everything belongs to the Lord. And your tie to money, your control over money, when that dissipates, guess what rises in your life? Peace. If I'm over the outcome, I'm anxious. If he's over the outcome, I'm available. One hand is closed. Scripture says that the world of the greedy gets smaller. You could see that. People just close off. Why? Because they think it's theirs. And when their industry goes down, when a lawsuit happens, when the stock market drops off, they're collapsed. Why? They thought it was theirs. And God says, no, 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 I'll take care of you. But today I'm challenging you. What if 100% of us never became led by money? Money's a decent tool. It's just a bad leader. Can I get an Amen. It's just a bad leader. Can we never become the narcissistic, controlling, money-hungry people that use people to get money instead of using money to help people? Can we just all commit that we're going to go God's way, that we're just going to be managers? Some of you, in the next 30 days, you're going to get better at budgeting because you're like, oh, shoot, if it's his money, my eating out budget, watch this awful. Amen? Some of you are going to now have a, a bigger passion to steward God's money because you realize it's not yours. Right. And here's the last verse I'll leave you with. It's Proverbs chapter 16 that says, commit. Everybody say commit. Commit. <clears throat> commit to the Lord. Whatever you do, watch what he will do. God does not bless your belief. He loves that you believe. But he doesn't bless your belief. He blesses practice. So today, let's commit to the Lord. Before we ever get to the practices, let's first commit the practice of perspective, which is, I'm a manager. Who you're going to sleep better at night. Because some of you are trying to solve the issue in your industry as though it's brand new news to God. He has the answers. Wait on the Lord. Rest in the Lord. He owns it all. Commit to the Lord, whatever you do, and he will establish your plans.